Good morning. I'm Susan Hockfield, the president of MIT, and I am delighted to welcome you to the MIT Energy Forum. And I can't tell you how pleased I am to see how many of you there are here this morning as we kick off our day-long Energy Forum, uh, which is the culmination of a year's work by the Energy Research Council. This is an important day for MIT. Today, the Energy Research Council will outline the ways that MIT can offer leadership in one of the most urgent challenges of our time finding clean, affordable energy to power up the developed and the developing world. Of course, many of MIT's faculty and students are already at work on energy issues and producing significant breakthroughs. However, these discrete breakthroughs will have far more impact as parts of a coherent answer to the energy problems of the world. One where great science and engineering are informed by profound expertise in economics, architecture and urban planning, information technology, political science, and management. That's why we established the Energy Research Council last year and asked it to design an initiative to facilitate collaboration on this crucial issue across all of the Institute's five schools. I really have to thank very deeply everyone who contributed to this effort, and in particular, Professors Bob Armstrong and Ernie Moniz, who served as co-chairs, and also their 14 colleagues on the council. The council solicited advice and input from the entire MIT community and from external stakeholders. They listened attentively, and their recommendations reflect deep knowledge and deep vision. Now, Professor Moniz will talk about the energy initiative itself in just a moment. My role this morning is to take a step back and tell you why I believe this is a defining moment in the history of MIT. I want to answer the most, three most basic questions about this call to action. Why energy? Why MIT? And the short answer to the question, why energy, is popular demand. Early in my tenure here, I asked faculty members and students to identify MIT's opportunities and responsibilities in the decades ahead. The issue they spoke about most frequently, by a very wide margin, was energy. And they spoke about it passionately. And frankly, when a community as brilliant and diverse as those at MIT converges on one issue, it would be folly not to heed them. However, just as significant as the interest in energy here at MIT is the interest in the world beyond MIT. For the first time in a generation, the public and our political leaders have both turned their attention to the subject. Energy lies at the heart of the news of the day. Let me give you just a few quick examples. Just last week, President Bush again spoke of America's addiction to oil and its negative implications for our national security. Few of us can read about Brazil's new energy independence thanks to ethanol made from sugarcane without a sense of envy. Many Americans are shocked by gasoline at $3 a gallon. We marvel at the success of Toyota and its hybrid cars, and once again, we fear for Detroit's future. Business leaders and all of us worry that the energy needs of China's exploding economy will impinge on our own prosperity. And finally, the consequences of carbon-fueled climate change are of concern not just to MIT scientists like Harry Emanuel, but also to the residents who return to the Gulf Coast worried about a future of increasing weather intensity. This may be one of those rare moments when our society suddenly looks itself in the mirror and admits the truth. Our comfortable lives are due in large measure to cheap and abundant fossil fuels, yet we know that we will pay a steep price if our utilization of those fuels does not change. As a nation, however, we've made so little progress on energy in recent decades that many Americans are simply fatalistic about the issue. The political promises made in the wake of the oil crises of the 70s prompted very little enduring action. As a business, energy tends to be enormously capital intensive, 
which slows the pace of change to a generational crawl. In fact, in the last few decades, we've seen more transformative advances in the way we consume music than in the way we consume energy. Of course, energy is not a single challenge that can be answered with a piece of technology as clean, appealing, and profitable as an iPod. It is three intertwined challenges, each vexing and complex in its own right. The first involves supply and demand. In a business-as-usual future, energy use worldwide is likely to double by mid-century, driven in part by the enormous appetite of the developing economies. China alone has been increasing its energy use by about 10% a year, with profound impacts on energy markets. Competition for scarce resources is increasingly global, and we Americans can no longer assume the ready availability of cheap fossil fuels far into the future. The world as a whole needs to develop new sources of energy and to increase dramatically the efficiency in which they are used. This leads to the second challenge, security. Obviously, we all understand the risks that accompany too great a dependence on foreign energy, particularly from politically unstable parts of the world. We also need to secure extended energy delivery systems, which are vulnerable to disruption, whether from sabotage or from natural disasters. We must remember that major wars have been fought over access to scarce resources, and our dependence on oil for transport means growing prospects for conflict over energy supply. And while there is a renewed interest in nuclear power as an alternative to carbon-based fuels, we must answer the questions about the consequent potential for the proliferation of nuclear weapons. The third challenge, of course, is the environment. How will we meet our increasing demand for energy without smothering the earth in greenhouse gases? After all, the internal combustion engine is a brilliant piece of technology. Until the price of gasoline rises so high as to make alternatives to it economical, it's here to stay. We have to look at improving efficiency in our continuing use of fossil fuels and possibly mitigating their impact with large-scale carbon sequestration. At the same time, we clearly have to expand dramatically our use of technologies that are less carbon intensive or are carbon free. As a problem, energy is hydra headed. Concentrating on one set of fangs while ignoring the others is hardly a strategy for self preservation. Yet the public debate on energy has largely focused on patchwork solutions, such as how to lower the cost of gasoline at the pump in the short term. At MIT, starting today, we intend to redirect this debate toward the entire energy system. It's time to consider measures that will improve the world's energy infrastructure and energy mix. It's time to support the basic research that will transform this infrastructure in the long term. And it's time to make sure that this infrastructure will suit a rapidly evolving world so that economic growth worldwide can help solve our energy problems rather than exacerbate them. This leads me to my second question. Why MIT? Why are we the right people to lead this charge? Obviously, no single institution alone is going to transform the energy landscape. But the unique character of MIT offers something important to the equation. We believe we can be a catalyst for a technological phase shift. We have the expertise in science, technology, public policy, economics, urban design, and management to produce transformational advances. We also have a history of solving problems across disciplines. Our forebears wove a practical mindset into the fabric of this institution, an engineering determination to fix it. We were established as a land-grant university with an active, activist mission to promote the public good. We have long since proven that when we focus on large issues of great public importance, we are able to get things done. The Radiation Laboratory here at MIT played a decisive role in the Allied victory in World War II, designing over 100 radar systems used in the war. And it established a successful model for connected science, a collaboration between scientists, industry, and the government that continues today at MIT. In the process, the Rad Lab laid the foundations for modern electronics. This is exactly the connected model 
that will help us address the challenges posed by energy. MIT is also the place where many of the most important technologists of tomorrow will be educated. By expanding our energy curriculum, we can steer them toward this challenge. Clearly, given the appetite for energy in developing economies like China and India, the international nature of fuel production and estimates that electricity has yet to reach billions of people worldwide, it is going to take a global perspective to solve the world's energy problems. This, too, is an area where MIT has expertise. Ten years ago, MIT joined forces with universities in Japan, Sweden, and Switzerland to create the Alliance for Global Sustainability, a joint research program focused on environmentally sound development worldwide. And last year, MIT partnered with the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences to found a new center to study the environmental, hydrologic, and management issues surrounding the crucial resources of petroleum and water. As a community, we are also in a unique position to push forward market-based reforms in energy, not just because of our close collaborations with industry, but also because of our history of innovation and entrepreneurship. A study a decade ago estimated that if you added up the earnings of companies started by MIT graduates and faculty, together they would represent the 24th largest economy in the world. If you added in the gain from technologies and innovation, simply in whose development the MIT family played a significant role, it would, of course, be far larger. Now, even while we expect to work closely with industry and government on this energy initiative, let's not forget how important universities are to progress of all kinds. Our diverse talents and our position outside of political and commercial constraints means we can try things and we can say things that the other big players in this game may not be able to. We very much hope to be viewed as an honest broker of energy solutions. And so we arrive at my last question, why now? I mentioned earlier that public and political willingness to address this problem is as high as it has been in a generation. Climbing oil prices, as painful as they may be in the short term, are making the marketplace more receptive to transformative technologies than it has ever been in the past. The entrepreneurial and venture capital engines created to advance the IT and biotech revolutions are starting to look seriously at energy. However, the news outside of MIT is not the only reason that the moment is ripe for MIT to lead an energy charge. There is also the tremendous hope that is being generated within MIT by our own promising research. For example, nanoscience breakthroughs by MIT scientists may overcome the major technological impediment to electric cars, the weight, cost, and weak performance of today's batteries. Advances in photovoltaics being developed here could make solar power a more practical option. Bioengineering research here at MIT may help us create better biofuels as a substitute for petroleum. And improvements in the technology of nuclear power plants could help us reduce CO2 emissions on a large scale. These are but a very few among many examples of critical breakthroughs on the horizon at MIT. I firmly believe that university research and teaching can transform our use of energy just as they have transformed our use of information. The results will not just be a cleaner and a safer world, but also a more prosperous world. Professor Robert Solow, one of MIT's Nobel Prize winners in economics, has estimated that more than half of America's economic growth over the last 60 years derives directly from technological innovation. Too often, energy transformation has been viewed as carrying a heavy societal cost. In fact, it has the potential for great social and economic gain. It's time for the field of energy to experience a flowering of creativity that it has not seen in decades. There are tremendous opportunities here for those who take on the challenges. At MIT, we intend to provide the leadership this critical issue demands. Thank you all for coming today.
Well, thank you, uh, President Hockfield, for that uh, stirring uh, introduction uh, to this day's, uh, the, uh, day's events. And I'd like to add, uh, I'm certainly on behalf of the Energy Research Council, uh, and I think uh, many, many more, uh, our thanks for the uh, unwavering and committed support uh, to this initiative that has come from uh, President Hockfield uh, and her uh, entire senior leadership team. Uh, really, this has been the, the driving element uh, for uh, our, our, our commitment to this, uh, to this new, uh, new adventure. The, um, uh, as noted, uh, uh, almost a year ago, uh, President Hockfield formed uh, uh, the Energy Research Council uh, that I had the uh, pleasure to co-chair with uh, Barb Armstrong uh, with 16 faculty uh, from all five schools. Uh, bringing uh, all these diverse perspectives uh, to how we might formulate uh, recommendations uh, to the president uh, for how MIT can maximize its contribution and its impact uh, in this uh, in this energy uh, energy arena, the uh, the names of the of the faculty are here. You will see several of them later on in our in our panel discussions. Uh, today, uh, my uh, my role here will be to provide an overview uh, of uh, of our recommendations of our report leaving much of the discussion about uh, the sp specific research areas to the three following panels. Uh, as was already mentioned, let me re uh, reiterate it. Uh, besides our thanks to, to the president, uh, the provost, uh, and uh, the deans uh, and others, uh, that we also really want to thank the community because clearly these 16 people uh, you could multiply by at least 10 uh, in terms of those who can provide uh, uh, major and important input uh, to, the, to the council from the faculty, multiply by more than 10 among the student bodies. Uh, and what I want to emphasize is that uh, those inputs, in fact, were heard and were a major part of the, uh, of the enterprise. Uh, we solicited uh, white papers for suggestions from groups of faculty as to areas that they found important, that they were willing to pursue. We probably got six or seven times the number we had expected, well over 30 uh, uh, papers. Uh, students uh, uh, came forward. The graduate students uh, have been uh, enormously energetic through, uh, particularly through the Energy Club, which has now grown to over 300 members and, and have had their sometimes exhausting 100th event uh, already. Uh, they provided uh, input undergraduates, uh, particularly through living group uh, uh, meetings, of course with Chinese food, uh, provided uh, substantial input. Uh, so it's really been a real community, uh, uh, community effort, and as, uh, as Susan already said, uh, listening uh, on all of our parts was, was, key, uh, was key to this. The, uh, next slide, good. The, um, in many ways, my principal role here, as I said, will be uh, to discuss sort of the framing of, of the initiative uh, in a, a bit more detail uh, than, than we've just heard. Um, the, 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 issue of, the issues of why energy and why MIT and why now uh, will all, all come out here again, uh, but uh, again with, a, with somewhat more of the, of the framing uh, uh, that we used for the report. The, uh, certainly, Energy uh, in, in the news today uh, is, is, uh, is, A, it's very obvious uh, and B, very important. But I must say, it is, that is, of course, neither uh, sufficient uh, or necessary for why MIT is, I think, moving forward on this initiative now, because we see these challenges as, as certainly uh, having a, being, being much more sustained than perhaps they have been in the past, uh, with a crying need for a new set of technology and policy tools. So here, I just note uh, what you might call the, the perfect storm of ener energy challenges. It drives many of the considerations of energy these days. Three major issues, uh, supply and demand, uh, energy and security, energy and environment. Uh, and uh, we'll come back and say, say a, a, bit, a bit more about these. But these drivers are often, of course, viewed as, an, as intention. Uh, and one of the issues is going to be to find those technology and policy pathways uh, that, in fact, uh, emphasize the synergies and our ability to address uh, uh, all of these challenges. I will also try to emphasize why, in our view, this is the right time, uh, why now is the time uh, for really a concerted push uh, uh, if we are to meet the challenges of this next, say, half century. Now, it's important to emphasize as well that while we here and elsewhere 
talk about these drivers of, of supply, of security, uh, of environment, we also, I think it's very important we start out with the realization that any uh, attempt to really project where we will be several decades down the road is really fraught with, uh, with considerable uh, danger uh, and occasionally uh, foolishness. Uh, the, the, the uncertainties are, are of many types. They involve resource availability. Uh, the issue of, of oil availability is always in the news, but what about land for renewables, for example? If one reaches the scale where renewables uh, can hopefully make a very, very large impact, there are issues of where sci science and technology will, uh, uh, will go. On the one hand, technology breakthroughs. On the other hand, a better understanding of climate change impacts. Geopolitics obviously plays a large role in the, uh, in the uh, evolution of the energy infrastructure. Not only, again, the obvious ones about things like the Mi Middle East questions and oil supply, but also issues like what will be the future of climate protocol negotiation and, and, and implementation. Enormous impacts on how uh, energy technologies will actually uh, be deployed. And secondly, the, um, so basically the, the message there is, of course, we really, all of us, whether it's government or here at MIT as we structure our ideas going forward, it's really about options. It's, it's about providing a robust set of tools, uh, technologies and policies uh, to uh, provide the marketplace with the appropriate opportunities to respond uh, to these evolving uh, major, major drivers. And it's also worth, I think, uh, at least we kind of came into this with sort of a 50-year time scale, um, uh, not completely arbitrarily, as I, as, uh, as I will emphasize, uh, because in fact, the 50-year time scale is also part of the next year uh, imperative. In fact, it's useful to uh, look at uh, this historical picture first uh, before we look forward. This is a, um, a, a plot of the percentage of different fuels in contributing, in this case, to U.S. fuel uh, uh, energy supply. The, um, uh, actually, in today, if you look at the breakout uh, uh, of the various fossil fuels, the total fossil fuels, nuclear components, renewable components. It, it also isn't very different today, at least, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world. Uh, but if you look here, you see, of course, the, uh, the very important uh, founding of MIT here uh, at the, the transition from the uh, use of wood, uh, non-renewable use of wood, I might say, uh, to, uh, to coal, uh, and, then, uh, and then oil, and then gas. Uh, and the first thing to note is that, roughly speaking, 50 years is kind of a characteristic for major changes uh, in, that, in that fuel mix. This is a 150-year span, and we have seen fossil fuels coming in uh, uh, over this time. Uh, there's also, one can, never, one can never resist noting the famous uh, last words of William Barton Rogers, our founder of bituminous coal, and we shall see uh, whether... Uh, whether we prove as uh, prescient in talking about different kinds of evolution of the, of the energy infrastructure uh, over the next, uh, uh, next 50 years. Uh, but it's also important to, in, in looking at this, to, of course, recognize that the order of 85% of our energy is, is fossil fuel today, uh, with all of the implications uh, for that in terms of security and, clim and climate. Uh, it's also important to note that we should not underestimate the challenges for profound evolution of this energy system uh, over this next, say, half century in response to the security environmental challenges that I, that, I will, that I will note. And there are some very good reasons for that. I mean, fossil fuels, <laughs> frankly, are very, very convenient, uh, very energy intensive, relatively cheap, uh, lots of good reasons. And also, their introduction here I think it's important to, for perspective to realize that as these fossil fuels came in, particularly coal and oil, uh, they really provided dramatically new capabilities. Uh, the whole, the whole uh, uh, rapid industrialization, uh, in many ways driven, driven by coal, uh, mobility driven by oil, really critical new capabilities for, for society. As we go forward, and perhaps discuss, for example, here we have the, if you like, the carbon-free uh, wedge of nuclear and, uh, and non-hydro renewables. Uh, 
in going forward, it's really a different set of considerations, what you might call the externalities of security environment as opposed to the kind of new functionality. So this would be a new world in both, again, a technology and a policy, uh, and a policy sense. So in conclusion of this slide, I mean, uh, or the last slide, really, I'll go back to it, uh, uh, go back to the statement that this, all of this drives us in the, in, the, in, the, in the Energy Research Council, but again, also externally to recognize there's no silver bullet, and we really need to put together kind of a broad initiative pursuing multiple technology and policy options where, and to repeat uh, what President Hockfield said, what we, we, we believe we can bring to the table uh, in particular uh, are elements that we believe will prove very important. The ability to bring together people from different, di different disciplines, focusing on an important challenge uh, over a certain kind of time, uh, time horizon, and the, the entrepreneurial spirit that can help hopefully move us from laboratory to uh, influencing the marketplace of goods, services, and ideas. So um, this kind of, again, an emphasis here is on this 50-year 50 50 year time scale. Uh, now if we look, look forward, here is one of many projections. This, this is one using an MIT uh, 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 economic model. Uh, that looks forward 50 years, but the specifics aren't, aren't the issue. This is a so-called business as usual, that's the BAU, business as usual, meaning no major policy uh, changes, uh, no radically new technology uh, developments, business as usual going forward the next 50 years. Well, <laughs> it's business as usual. Uh, it has. Uh, it takes you from 85% fossil fuel today to maybe 87% fossil fuel in 2050. But the whole issue is, how is this going to evolve? How do we influence this evolution? That's very clear, while not saying this will not be uh, the, uh, the, uh, the case going forward, it's very clear such an evolution, business as usual, will provide enormous challenges from supply to climate to other kinds, of, other kinds of key issues. So what we're about, really, is providing the options to have a very different future as a possibility in this 50-year time frame. But if we want to influence it in 50 years, as we've already seen, we better start today certainly changing directions if we, in fact, are to realize uh, a, a dramatically different uh, uh, potential, at least, for, for evolution. This just, uh, well, this is hard to read, it does, doesn't matter. This just indicates uh, the, uh, the fact that this is, this is energy uh, and, gross and GDP uh, per person. Uh, you see a rough correlation uh, uh, in, in going up, way up here, I should, I'll point out, that's, that's the United States. This is a cluster of Western European uh, countries and, and Japan. And of course, most of the world, including China and India, are really down here close to the, uh, close to the origin, uh, but clearly with intent of moving up. In fact, uh, President Hockfield noted that China alone is increasing uh, energy by, uh, by around 10% uh, per year. The only point here is, particularly in the context of efficiency, how these countries evolve, for example, along, just along these two trajectories, would make an enormous difference in the demand requirements for, ener for, uh, for energy. So how technology is deployed uh, in these developing and emerging economies will be absolutely critical. And another uh, kind of indicator that I think it's worth looking at is this is a similar graph, except it's annual uh, per capita electricity use uh, in uh, kilowatt hours uh, per person per year. Again, the US is up here at, actually now it's about 13,000 kilowatt hours per person per year. Uh, it's plotted against the Human Development Index, which is a measure of educational, uh, healthcare, uh, and economic uh, attainment in various countries. Uh, and of course, you can see the huge uh, disparities by region from the uh, industrialized countries all being up here at very high human development index. It's a UN, a UN indicator uh, versus, let's say, the African countries in purple all being, or almost all being, South Africa the exception, almost all being nestled very close to zero electricity use. Indeed. Even with, tr with, even with a pathway to tripling global electricity use by mid-century, which is a typical projection, 
the IEA, the International Energy Agency, still projects 1.4 billion people in 2030 with no electricity. And so these are huge distributional issues that we need to address. It also talks about the scale of the problem in both the technical uh, and other, uh, including humanitarian, uh, senses. So that's, again, a, a bit more of the color on the issue of the demand, the demand side, uh, demand uh, uh, challenges, uh, both in megawatts and negawatts. Uh, but now let's turn briefly to energy and security. Uh, as, in fact, was noted, there are a variety of energy and security problems. There is the one that we pay most attention to, the availability of oil uh, in the context of, of geopolitical and uh, geological realities. Uh, but there are others. There's the vulnerability of extended energy delivery systems. We saw that in Katrina. Uh, we see it, or we read about it, uh, in terms of uh, terrorism in the Middle East, for example. Uh, there is the issue of nuclear proliferation, facilitated by a potential worldwide expansion of nuclear power. We see that debate going on also on the front pages today with regard to Iran. And less discussed, but the dislocation from environmental impacts that could have significant security challenges, for example, in the dislocation uh, of major populations, especially in those parts of the world that we just saw, the purple dots, where the lack of economic development uh, and energy availability can seriously compromise their ability to adapt to things like, uh, like, like climate change. Nevertheless, having, having talked about this broad set of security issues, uh, let's just say a few more words, again, to bring out the, the, the issues with regard to, uh, to fossil fuels. Uh, this just shows the, uh, in rough terms, uh, this is the wrong slide. Uh, it's showing the wrong numbers. I don't understand. I will skip this uh, and just say that I don't know where that one came from. Oh, here we come. Here we come. There we go. Very good. Move them in. <laughs> Thank you. OK. So there, there are the big ones. <laughs> uh, this shows uh, oil, coal, um, oil, uh, excuse me, oil, gas, and coal. And the obvious, the obvious uh, thing is what you all know is that there's an enormous concentration uh, of, uh, of oil uh, reserves in the Middle East in particular, of gas reserves in the Middle East and in Russia in particular, although less often emphasized uh, <laughs> is that there is also a large concentration of coal in the United States, um, China, India, a few other, few other countries, including, including Russia. The point being, of course, that particularly when we come to the environmental discussion, uh, we have a very unfortunate uh, correlation where coal is where the people are and oil and gas is where the people are not, uh, which, of course, is, uh, underlies much of, the, much of the challenge. So uh, uh, on this issue, uh, just a, a reminder, because I, this now helps starting to shape the technology agenda, in particular, te well, technology and policy agenda. Uh, in oil, we should remember that what the real issue is in terms of oil is that our transportation fuels market is, is essentially completely inelastic. Uh, therefore, we are highly dependent upon uh, the um, uh, continuing supply of, uh, of oil and preferably at uh, at affordable prices. Uh, you can define affordable. Uh, just want to note, uh, so what are the responses? Uh, as we now think about what's the agenda, what are the responses to this kind of a problem? Now, we could go through this for the other issues as well, but we won't. Uh, well, one issue is, for example, addressing sudden, sudden disruptions, um, be they caused by political move, by weather, by other, uh, other reasons. There are responses like strategic reserves, uh, maintain, maintaining well-functioning markets. My only point here is that really we need some new policies in these areas to uh, shore up our um, resilience to, su to, su to sudden disruption. Then, of course, there's the issue of increasing and diversifying supplies. Uh, enhanced production uh, from existing fields, for example, is a major science and technology uh, challenge, all the way down to unconventional sources we all hear about the tar sands in Canada, for example. Indeed, there is a lot of oil, but not so nice molecules uh, in various parts of the world that would contribute greatly to diversification. Weakening the, to use the president's term, addiction uh, to oil. Uh, efficient vehicles, alternative fuels derived from coal, gas, biomass. 
new transportation paradigms, be they plug-in hybrids, hydrogen uh, cars, these are all ways of addressing the oil and energy security issue. They are, they all need really aggressive development of new technologies that meet a variety of, of market tests. However, once again, we should not miss the perspective of how difficult this is, A, because oil and petroleum fuels are so convenient, but also because uh, to replace the enormous amount of energy uh, that, we, uh, that we use in oil by other sources, be it coal or gas or biomass or electricity for electrolysis of water, for example, we should understand these are enormous dislocations of other energy markets or of land use issues, of electricity markets. And so we really need, again, a comprehensive technology and policy suite of tools if we are, in fact, to address these issues. In moving to the third of the major drivers, uh, I will just focus on climate change. This cartoon uh, uh, is just an indicator of carbon in the atmosphere, in the oceans, uh, in the soils, et cetera. Uh, in, in billions of tons with a kind of a cartoon version of, of what the carbon cycle is like. We won't go through this in detail. Let me make a few statements, however, because it's important, again, for this time scale issue. First of all, we are uh, emitting today uh, roughly 7 gigatons, uh, 7 billion tons, gigatons per year of carbon in carbon dioxide. Uh, into the atmosphere from anthropogenic uh, sources. I'm going to make an assertion that um, because of the cumulative nature of carbon dioxide in particular in the atmosphere, and of course the major source is combustion of fossil fuels, that we have a emissions budget of around 700 billion tons before we reach a doubling of pre-industrial levels. Now this target of doubling does not have a rigorous basis in terms of climate modification, societal cost, et cetera. But the great majority of engaged scientists uh, would view this as a prudent, some would say too high, but a prudent limit at our current state of knowledge. Well, if we are emitting seven gigatons per year and our budget is 700, then obviously you divide that, that's 100 years. However, emissions rate are, em emission rates are increasing. We talked earlier about a possible doubling uh, of, of, of fossil energy use. If that were to occur, then this 100 years, of course, becomes much closer to a half a century. Again, the point that this 50-year period is critical if we are to address these issues of demand, security, and environment. And 50 years, once again, to repeat the message, means starting today, because it takes that long to really change over substantially a highly capitalized uh, infrastructure. I think I will, I will skip over this, just noting, uh, if you can read very quickly, uh, this slide, which is of U.S. Carbon, carbon emissions, tells you fundamentally where the focus is. Transportation, uh, which means, oops, there we go. <laughs> Transportation, that's a very big number. That's, of course, all oil. Again, make the point, transportation is oil. And electricity, mainly for, ser for serving buildings, uh, is an enormous source, and that's mainly from coal. So that, that begins to start to define the kind of space uh, that one needs to attack with new technology and, uh, and, and policy uh, if one wants to address this climate, climate problem. So again, this helps shape, as I've just said, the, the technology and policy pathways. And many of these, of course, an important point to mention, take carbon-free power, nuclear power, renewables, et cetera, these are examples, again, of looking for synergies because not only do they address the environmental issues, but they also address uh, security issues, for example, uh, and some of the demand, demand constraints. So with this framing, uh, really, really this kind of uh, set of drivers and this time scale uh, and these technology pathways that need to be followed, the Council uh, then organized its report, um, uh, this is the initiative, and today's agenda 
really along three major themes that we believe uh, are an architecture that would be very appropriate for framing our, at least, M uh, uh, MIT's and other uh, research institutions' approach to these challenges. Uh, you will hear about each of these in detail in the following three panels. Here, I will just summarize briefly what they are, uh, but please, uh, of course, uh, come uh, stay for the uh, uh, more in-depth discussion in each panel. The first category, science technology for a clean energy future, is really about capturing the idea that there really may be very key enabling technologies that can be transformational in this time frame of, of, of 50 years. Uh, examples, all of which came in from faculty groups, involve a, an array of renewable technologies, a critical enabling technology of storage and conversion without storage, for example, at scale intermittent renewables will not be practical. Other kinds of enabling science technology growing out of existing capabilities, for example, superconducting and cryogenic components are a major technology focus at the fusion center, providing a platform for, uh, for other work of relevance to energy. Nanotechnology already mentioned, critical for all kinds of applications uh, in efficiency, in storage, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, nuclear fusion, I just mentioned, another example of a potential transformational technology, although with all due respect to my friends, some will argue on the 50 years on, on that, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, second general area, improving today's energy systems, is the notion, uh, which President Hockfield uh, uh, already uh, mentioned, that an initiative that, roughly, I mean, roughly speaking, is focused on home runs, um, is not really answering the question about how we get from here to there. Uh, the fact is today our, our energy systems are dominated uh, by fossil fuels. Uh, nuclear power is the major, uh, is currently the major uh, carbon-free deployed technology besides hydro, um, uh, which has its own challenges. And so working with industry in much more effective use of today's energy systems, of evolution of today's energy systems, of higher efficiency, will be a very, very important part of, of what we do. Some here might raise the question, well, since these are today's energy systems, industry must be doing all the work. And what can you add? Well, clearly, that is a, uh, <laughs> would be an exaggeration. But I want to emphasize two points. There are key enablers that very much go to basic science and, and really go beyond what, what individual firms do, such as, for example, carbon sequestration which has major challenges, but is really uh, an essential uh, technology if, for example, coal is to be used at large scale in a greenhouse gas constrained world. We have a strong program in that. There are also areas where the very nature of a university having a broad set of disciplines can come to tools that are typically beyond the realm of any individual firm, even large ones. I'll mention things like, uh, some of the advanced simulation technologies, for example, uh, applied across the board in, uh, in energy are very important. And finally, uh, as several of, the, uh, of these uh, white papers uh, emphasize, it is absolutely critical that we address the policy and societal aspects of the use of these fuels over these next decades. This, in many ways, will shape how the system evolves over these next decades on our way to an unknown but possibly dramatically transformed energy infrastructure in, in 50 years. And finally, in our third, our third major, major theme is one that emphasizes the global nature of so many of these challenges and also the distributional challenges that we alluded to earlier in that slide about global electricity use. Uh, this, this includes looking at climate change itself, uh, understanding the science, the policy, how they integrate uh, much better, but things like the critical need for efficient building technologies, advanced transportation systems, understanding how the demographics of possible, in quotes, gigacities, especially in the developing world, may change our whole ideas about how an energy infrastructure evolves. Very critical issues. 
uh, ones that we definitely want to address, uh, and uh, uh, and as I'll come back to, uh, also get get directly engaged in uh, more than we are today. Uh, so these are the again these are the three panels that, that that will come up. I would just emphasize once more that we believe there is an important additionality by bringing together multiple disciplines that this will make a huge difference in, 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 many, uh, in many of these areas and to, again, uh, draw upon uh, our traditional, uh, I think, success in being able to go from the laboratory to the technology marketplace. Let me just conclude with some brief remarks uh, about a couple of other areas which we are not focusing on as much today but are very, very critical. Education, obviously. First of all, we all understand here uh, how research and education are inextricably linked, and frankly, how it is the students that we produce who are by far uh, our most important uh, product, uh, if, if you like. Uh, the nature of the energy business, that it's not, it is not neatly fit into one department or one school, also means there are challenges that we need to work on for interdisciplinary education. Uh, and we will do that. We make, we make re uh, recommendations for a number of, uh, of, uh, of approaches uh, in an un undergraduate uh, co uh, context. For example, we will have two new courses uh, funded by the Darbaloff Fund uh, uh, going forward uh, the gra in graduate courses, getting more coherence to, to the program, and in outreach, uh, student projects in developing world countries coupled to research going on at MIT. In the last panel of today, uh, in the question and answer panel, uh, in addition to President Hockfield and, and Bob Armstrong, uh, the, the, the co-chair, uh, we will have uh, Jeff Tester, uh, who chaired our education subcommittee, uh, uh, Dave Danielson, uh, president of the Energy Club, who particularly weighed in on education uh, uh, on the panel, and also Vladimir Belovich, who, will, who chaired our subcommittee on campus energy management, which is the next topic, what, what we somewhat facetiously call walking the talk, uh, the idea being that clearly uh, with our focus on this sustainable energy uh, future, uh, we can do more on campus, uh, A, to reflect that commitment, but B, very importantly, to use it as again a laboratory for our students and our faculty uh, to do research uh, and, to, uh, and, and to learn. Uh, there are clearly a number of direct benefits noted in the first, uh, the first bullet, lower energy cost, energy use, uh, et cetera. But let me focus on, first of all, there is an enormous enthusiasm that's been brought out for working on these issues on the campus. And that enthusiasm uh, involved uh, faculty, our facilities group, our environmental office, and very, very strong student engagement. Uh, in fact, I'll just advertise, some of you may have seen uh, outside uh, a, uh, a uh, solar car. While this is not about a building, but this is about, again, another group of incredibly motivated students who are planning to have a solar car summit here on campus this summer uh, with teams from, uh, I, don't, I forget, 28 countries or, or something uh, uh, coming together. So it's a tremendous amount of initi uh, initiative and enthusiasm around, uh, around these issues. Uh, so we do recommend uh, a sustainable campus energy initiative. Uh, the next step is a, is a comprehensive assessment and analysis uh, of various approaches. Uh, we would just note that a preliminary assessment has been encouraging uh, that uh, using energy conservation for existing buildings, uh, infrastructure renewal, uh, maybe code, code generate, more co-generation, uh, more green design of new buildings, that we can actually uh, make a lot of progress in a, in a uh, in a economically uh, uh, wise way, which of course would be uh, very important also, hopefully as, as, as an example, and also use all of those activities uh, uh, as, uh, as research, research venues. So this will also be, I think, a very important uh, activity that will really bring the whole campus together, uh, as President Hockfield uh, uh, wished, uh, in focusing on, on energy. So finally, and this, this really is finally, and I will skip over that. That's our challenge goal. Launching the initiative, I'll close by saying that, again, our core objective is to supplement ongoing research, not to subsume it, of course. There's lots of activity going on in departments and laboratories with a portfolio of multidisciplinary, multifaculty, 
multi-year sustained research efforts on a number of these key energy challenges. The multi-year is important. It, will, it, will, it implies commitment on both sides, those who uh, may support the activities and those here, the faculty and others, uh, who must carry out the activities. Again, uh, mentioned earlier, many of these, we have a number of attributes that we believe will contribute to success in this. Uh, interdisciplinary uh, tradition has been, has been emphasized, uh, uh, technology innovation. I think also it's worth noting that historically, every now and then, there's been kind of a campus-wide bringing muscle to bear on a complex societal problem, uh, and our response has been characterized, I think, by creativity, but also <laughs> groundedness in, uh, in, in reality. Uh, industrial collaboration, international partnerships, convening power for key conversations, as President Hockfield said, frankly, will be very explicit. We do very much hope that with this focus, uh, with a strengthening of these cross-campus uh, initiatives, that we will have uh, amplified the options for the opportunities to be an honest broker in framing and analyzing important societal discussions uh, on energy with their very significant science and technology uh, components. So realistically, we talk about a phased uh, approach. We want to see this build up over, over about five years. Uh, uh, we will have to align this, of course, with, with, uh, with sources of support. We suggest what could be, for example, uh, a starting portfolio around solar power, nuclear power, integration of science and policy of climate change, areas where we have very robust programs today with the opportunities uh, to expand their, their depth and scope, uh, but also, very importantly, seeding new projects, new thrusts that will, that will follow in uh, as we build up the, the initiative and move towards things like central research space uh, for, uh, for moving into pilot scale facilities, et cetera. And so we list here again some of them that span these, uh, these three major areas, uh, biofuel, storage, um, uh, simulation, subsurface uh, energy and science where there may be many, many synergies from oil recovery to sequestration, buildings, transportation, many, many uh, options. Again, these will be realized uh, in collaboration between our faculty interests uh, and uh, industry, government, uh, and other uh, possible supporters. So, in con so finally, in conclusion, the energy challenge obviously is formidable. Uh, this framing was not intended uh, to downplay uh, the, uh, the challenge uh, because it is, uh, it is enormous. Uh, as was said earlier, MIT cannot do it all. We have no, 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 uh, no, no pretense uh, about that. But we do believe that with these attributes that have been discussed, we do have a chance to make uh, a very, very uh, significant uh, difference, uh, both in terms of the science, technology, and policy options, but also in terms of stimulating a broader, a broader discussion and helping perhaps to mediate some of those discussions uh, in, uh, uh, in going forward.